connection that uh, Rav Sobejic of Yeshiva University made. That is, we know that when a person loses a close relative, there is mourning, there's Avelis. We have all the laws of Avelis, and that is called private Avelis, private mourning. <coughs> In Hebrew, Avelis of a Yachid. But then there is what is called communal mourning, which is the mourning that we have over the Beis HaMikdash. Uh, theoretically, we're supposed to mourn over the Beis HaMikdash the whole year. It's not just to be just Tisha B'Av or the three weeks or whatever it is. Uh, one thinks about the loss of the Beis HaMikdash the entire year. But obviously, it gets intensified during this period of time. Uh, and that's called Avelis of Rabin, the Avelis of the many, the mourning of the many. So there's Avelis of a Yachid, and there is Avelis of the Rabim. But there's a very big difference in the trajectory of the Avelis. When you have Avelis of the Yachid, it starts off very severe, and it gets progressively easier with the passage of time. So you start off with Shiva for seven days after the burial. You don't leave the house, you know, people come to you. And then we have 30 days of mourning in which you go out, but there are some restrictions. And for most relatives, it's finished after that. For a parent, we have uh, mourning, but it's a more relaxed mourning for up to a year. But it gets easier and easier and easier till finally you're no longer subject to the mourning. By contrast, the trajectory of Avelos for the Chorban Beis Hamikdash gets progressively stricter and more limiting as time goes by. We start with the three weeks. The 17th of Tammuz inaugurates the three-week period. So first of all, for Sephardim, there's like no such thing as the three weeks, but almost. I mean, basically, they fast on Tammuz, and there's like no restrictions, more or less, different customs. So for Ashkenazim, we have some stuff that we stop doing for the three weeks. Uh, we don't make weddings. We don't listen to live music. We don't get haircuts. And then comes the nine days, Rosh Chodesh Av, in which we don't bathe or shower, uh, we don't do laundry, we don't wear fresh laundry clothes. And then comes the week of Tisha B'Av. Now this year there is no week of Tisha B'Av because since Tisha B'Av will be observed on Sunday, there is no week. But if Tisha B'Av would be Wednesday, there would be special laws for Sunday, Monday, Tuesday that are even stricter than the nine days generally. So for example, when people make a seum, they finish a tractate so they can eat meat during the nine days. Uh, well, once you're the week of Tisha B'Av, you know, you don't, even, you don't even do that, but this year there's no week of Tisha B'Av. And then Erev Tisha B'Av is even stricter, although this year it's Shabbos, so that doesn't apply. Right? So the problem basically is, you understand the inconsistency here. When it comes to mourning a private loss, we start off very tough, very strict, and we get progressively easier. When it comes to mourning the Beis HaMikdash, we start off very lenient and we get progressively stricter. Why is that so? Sir Rav Soloveitchik uh, expressed the idea that the purpose of the mourning is different in the two institutions. When a person suffers a private loss, their life is often shattered. They often feel they cannot go on. They lose a parent, they lose a spouse. God forbid they lose a child. Basically, they're so devastated with loss that they have no way to go on. And by the way, I would add that even when a person's relationship with, for example, with a parent was very difficult, and even when it was even abusive, God forbid, there is still a devastation when a parent dies. And the reason is because as long as someone was alive, there always was some thought that maybe things could get better. Maybe there could be reconciliation. And when it turns out, no, that's very devastating. In fact, you'd be surprised. Even spouses that were divorced for many, many years, when a divorced spouse died, that is a very traumatic event. I mean, I've been involved with, with people in that situation, and they're really an unacknowledged mourner. Nobody thinks that, you know, I, mean, I mean, somebody got divorced 25 years ago from somebody, and somebody, and the guy died. You know, no one's going to start comforting the woman for her. Now, if there are children, you know, they'll comfort the children, but they're not going to comfort the woman because she lost her divorced spouse. But even then, they were together, they were connected. It was part of her life or his life. 
right? So with mourning, the problem is we are so overwhelmed. We are so devastated with loss that halacha gives us a re-entry procedure where we're able to have an inner healing. We're able to eventually rejoin society. So it starts off with shiva. You don't go out yet, you're too fragile. We come to you. And then like sticking your toe in a freezing cold swimming pool. You know, a little bit of a toe, a little bit at a time. You go, you go, you go, you go. And what's the end point? The end point is you're now ready to rejoin a regular life. That doesn't mean you forget your bereavement, but you can compartmentalize it. Because what happens is when a person is overwhelmed with grief, it takes over every part of themselves. There's no room for anything else. And what halacha basically creates a mechanism where you're still going to have that sadness in your head, but you put it in a certain like file cabinet. So you're able to smile again, you're able to laugh again, you're able to go to work and be productive, to learn again, right? All the things that a person does. In other words, Avelos is a great healing process to allow a person to eventually rejoin society. Because that's the will of God. God does not want us to grieve. I mean, even the Holocaust. God did, God did not want us to sit around and be devastated by the Holocaust. God wants us to rebuild, to move on. Not to forget, but not to be paralyzed. To go on and create and be productive and even be happy. And that is why Avela starts off really, really strict and it gets progressively more relaxed because the end goal is integration into the normalcy of life. Now, when it comes to the Chorban Beis Hamikdash, we have the opposite problem. How many of us, and I include myself, are so devastated over the loss of the temple that they can't get out of bed, he says. I can't, I can't move. I can't get out. The Beis Hamikdash. I mean, I mean, I hate to say it, but it's almost like a joke if somebody were to say that. It's kind of a new creative excuse why I didn't go to davening, right? Your Rebbe asks you, why didn't you go to Shul today? And you say, Rebbe, the Chorban Beis Hamikdash was so heavy in my heart, I just couldn't move. I'm sorry. We don't feel that way. We just don't feel that way. And the reason why we don't feel that way is we don't know what it is that we don't have and we don't know what it is that we're missing and we don't know what it is in our lives that's not here. How do you explain color to a person who was born blind? And how do you explain music to a person who was born deaf which was never part of their experience? How can they get it? Right, a person who became blind, you know, knows what it is. A person who became deaf knows what it is. A person who never experienced it. The generation who experienced the Chorban Beis Hamikdash, they knew what they were grieving for. And they were devastated. The Gemara says in Maseches Bava Basra that there were people who decided they would never eat meat or drink wine again until the temple is rebuilt. Because how can I enjoy wine and eat meat if there's no korbanos or wine libations? Now, the sages didn't like that. They said, well, if you're taking that attitude, then how can you eat bread if we don't have meal offerings or the show bread? So they said, okay, we will just live on fruit and water. Well, how can you eat fruit? We no longer bring the first fruits to the temple. Okay, we'll live on water. Well, how can you drink water since you no longer have the water libation that's brought on Sukkot? In other words, you can't do that. You got to go on. You got to live. They were devastated and they needed the teaching that you have to rejoin society. But they were the generation that experienced it. In fact, the Gemara actually says, the, the Medrash says that 
Rav Yochanan, who lived a few hundred years after the Chorban, would describe the sorrows that Am Yisrael suffered at the time of the Chorban, and he would give a great, great list, like a hundred, I don't remember the exact number, but a big number. Now the Gemara asks, Rav Yudah Hanasi was much closer to the Chorban, and he gave much less of a number. Why was his list shorter than Rav Yochanan? The Gemara says, because Rav Yudah Hanasi broke down crying, he couldn't finish the list because he had, he had much more of a vivid memory. By the time we got to Rabbi Yochanan, he was able to give you a big list because it no longer had that emotional pull on him. So our problem is not that we are so overwhelmed with devastation over the Beis Hamikdash that we need a re-entry procedure to get out of our grief. We're the opposite. We have to get into our grief to kind of appreciate what it is that we don't have. And therefore, the Avelis moves in the opposite direction. The Avelis moves to gradually get you more sensitized to sadness and tragedy so that on Tisha B'Av you will feel that sadness and that tragedy. It moves the opposite way. You know, a certain rabbi told a story. I'm not sure if I should tell the story because not, uh, it reflects badly on people and this is not a time where we should put anybody down. This is a time of Avas Yisrael. But I'll tell you the story just to illustrate something that it's not so much a put down of other people. It's a muster to us as well. The rabbi was uh, walking around and he, during the nine days and he bumped into some congregants who seemed very, very heartbroken, very sad. And the rabbi assumed that they were thinking about the Beis HaMikdash, about Golos, about the sufferings of the Jewish people. And the rabbi tried to comfort them and saying, you know, this is a difficult time. We're in a time of golos and korban. But Hashem will help us. Hashem will not abandon us. Hashem will bring us back. So the congregant looked up and said, oh yeah? Hashem didn't help us last night when the Yankees lost the game. In other words, in other words, they weren't sad over the base of Mikdash, they weren't even thinking about the base of Mikdash. They were sad because the Yankees lost a game. <laughs> now, you know, we can look down and say, you know, well, those people have no sensitivity, but, but again, this is, we have to ask ourselves kind of the, the very, very same question. What is it that we don't have? And the answer is, we don't know. We just don't know what it is we don't have. And somebody asked the Svasemis, what can I do if I can't cry over the Beis HaMikdash? And his answer was, cry over the destruction of your soul that's not capable of crying over the Beis HaMikdash. You know, there's a famous uh, story. It's part of Israeli uh, folk traditions, like an Israeli story, no, not, not a Torah story per se. You know, we had um, in June 1967, we had the famous uh, Six-Day War. Uh, most of you were, were not born then, but we older folk you know, were around. Uh, I was in nursery, and I was a little, little older than nursery. And uh, it was a great, great, miraculous victory. There were casualties, but Baruch Hashem, they were relatively small. And we gained so much. It was really a, a miraculous type of war. Uh, we gained back the old city, the Temple Mount, Hebron, all sorts of places. And, and, uh, and the like, many people really thought, and perhaps that was the case, Mashiach was on its way. And in fact, uh, the whole what's called the Baal Tshuva movement of young people coming back and being inspired uh, to seek out Judaism kind of started in the aftermath of the Six-Day War. Both Or Sameach and Eish Torah are kind of responses to the Six-Day War because there was a real awakening, a spiritual awakening in Klal Yisrael because they saw the hand of God. So imagine this, uh, we were not able to go to the Kotel Hamaravi, the Western Wall, for 19 years, from 1948, when the old city was surrendered to the Arab legions, to 1967. Although it's interesting, I actually know a guy, this is really quite amazing. Um, I, I know a Jewish fellow who managed to visit the Kotel more than once between 1948 and 1967. And this was quite, quite amazing. 
because uh, you couldn't go with an Israeli passport for sure. And if uh, you had a Jewish sounding name, you also could not uh, get in. But he had like fake passports and fake names and everything else. And uh, he managed to visit, now, of course, and even if you visit the Kotel, you can't pray like a Jew because that's going to get you in trouble too. But he managed to do this quite, quite uh, almost miraculous. And he really was putting his life in danger in those days. But in 1967, the Kotel was liberated. The old city was liberated. So almost the first soldiers who came to the Kotel were Hester Yeshiva. These are the Yeshiva students who are also in the army. Again, a little controversial uh, within the Haredi world, but uh, <laughs> they're very heroic uh, uh, kids, and uh, you know, they, they make a big kid of Shashem. And they were at the Kotel, and they were davening, and they were crying, and they were sobbing. Remember, the Kotel is a, is a strange place in many ways. When you're at the Kotel, are you happy or are you sad? Like, what exactly is the emotion of the Kotel Maravi? It's really a mixed emotion. I'm happy that I could pray and I could daven at the last place where God's presence is there. The Shekhinah never left the Kotel Maravi. But the Kotel is also a place of great sadness. Because all we have is this wall. It's not even the wall of the temple. Remember, the Kotel is not the wall of the temple. It is the wall of the temple mount. Okay, it's not the wall of the base of Mikdash. Well, first of all, it's obviously not the wall of the temple, but it's not even the wall of the courtyard of the temple, which had the Mizbeach in it. It is not the wall of the Azar, it's the wall of the Harabayat. So that's all we have. And what's on the Harabayat? Mosques. And uh, Mos yeah, Muslims have taken it over. Uh, you know, it's still against Israeli law. All right, so halachically, I don't want to get into the halacha. Halachically, most gedolim do paskin that we are not allowed to even go in the harabayat because of concerns of tuma and the like without the red heifer. Okay. Some people have a different psak halacha, I'm not putting it down, and they feel you could go, and they go. But you know, it's still against Israeli law to really daven at the harabayat because it causes provocation, it causes Arab riots. You dive into the Harabayat, you're going to be arrested by Jewish policemen. You will be arrested. You take a glass of water and you make a bracha, you're going to be arrested. You've got to surreptitiously put a newspaper up to your face and mumble, mumble something. I mean, it's quite amazing. So on one hand, we look at the Kotel, we have tremendous joy. On the other hand, we, we want and we need so much more than we have. Right, so the kotel is ma'orer, it awakens a sadness as well. So anyway, the chayalim that were there from the Hester, they were singing and dancing and crying. And a short distance away was a secular soldier, a non-religious soldier, who began crying as well. So one of his friends asked him, he says, what are you crying about? They're crying because they believe this was the temple and they believe this was God's presence and you know they're crying with emotion, with joy, with sadness, all the different emotions. You don't believe in God, you don't keep the mitzvahs, you don't keep the Torah. Why are you crying? And the person responded, I'm crying because I don't understand what they're crying about. I see from their reaction there is something powerful here. I don't have no idea what it is. And I feel so empty. Well, I think we have to say, this is not only the response of this Chiloni fellow. This is our dilemma. What is it? No matter how from you are, no matter how religious you are, what is it that I'm supposed to be mourning about? Now again, you have to understand, in some ways, our vocabulary is not, is not really using the right words. We talk about destruction of the base of Mikdash. The base of Mikdash was a building. It was a beautiful building, to be sure. But you know, if the yeah. only thing that happened was a beautiful building got destroyed, okay, there are other beautiful buildings. Some buildings might even be prettier than the base of Mikdash. Taj Mahal. 
right? I shouldn't say this. You know, it's probably a prettier building than the base on Mikdash was, you know, as it were. Uh, and in Yerushalayim here, if you look, if you ever go to the Bell's Shoal, the big, big Shoal of Bell's, it resembles architecturally the Beis Hamikdash. Like some people call it the Beis Hamikdash because it actually looks like the Beis Hamikdash. We're not crying over a building as beautiful as it was. We're crying over the fact that the destruction of the Beis Hamikdash was symbolic of God's presence leaving the world. Now, what does, that, what does that even mean? We're just full of things we don't know. Of course God is still with us. Of course God still protects us. Of course, otherwise we wouldn't survive at all. But there's been a reduction of that intimacy. There's been, we're no longer as connected as we were. There's an estrangement. There's a separation. And what I cry for is that separation, that estrangement. It's been so long. I want to get together again. I want to be with Hashem again. That's what we're praying for. We're not praying for a building. The building is symbolic of a relationship. What we pray for is the relationship which the building symbolizes. We are not praying for a building. I mean, we could, once we were just a building, we could build a building that would look just as good. Right? So that's kind of what we think about. We think about what does it mean to have a relationship with God? And that's how we rebuild the base of Mikdash. You know, the concept is it is said that every generation and every person must actively try to rebuild the temple. But that doesn't mean although some people do take it that way. That doesn't mean I go on the Temple Mount, I bomb the mosques, and I start building the building. Halakhically, it doesn't even mean that, putting aside the politics, because the Rambam says, Maimonides said, that this is the job of Mashiach. It's not our job to physically build a temple. And Rashi says even more than Maimonides. Maimonides puts the task on Mashiach. Rashi says the third temple is going to come down from heaven. We're not going to do anything. So what does it mean we have to build the temple? It means like this. If you go back to the original commandment to build the first temple, which is the Mishkan, the tabernacle of the desert, because that was the prototype for the Beis HaMikdash in Jerusalem. So the Pasuk says, Hashem commanded, V'yasu li mikdash, make for me a sanctified space, vishachanti bitocham, so I can dwell in them. Chazal say, it does not say, make for, make for me a mikdash, so I will dwell in it, in the building, but make for me a mikdash, so I will dwell in their hearts and their souls. So really, the Beis HaMikdash is a symbolic of Hashem dwelling in our heart and in our soul. So conversely, when Hashem does not dwell in our heart and in our soul, there's no Mikdash anymore. So how do I rebuild the temple? Not by physically rebuilding the temple, but by making my heart and my soul a place for God's presence. When I make my heart a place where Hashem resides, and enough people do that, there's a critical mass, I can't give you the number, but if enough people do that, then we get the Beis HaMikdash. So the Beis HaMikdash depends on us. Do I make my heart and soul a place where God's presence lives? Now the Talmud Yerushalmi tells us that every generation in which the temple is not rebuilt is as guilty as the generation where the temple was destroyed. Now this is an interesting teaching that's not necessarily intuitive. Without this you show me, I might have thought the following. The generation in which the temple was destroyed were really bad, they had all sorts of sins. 
and they lost the temple because of their sins. We're not so bad, but we don't have the merit to get it back. That's what I would have thought. The Talmud Yerushalmi is teaching you that that's a mistake. You don't need special merits to get the temple back. All you need is not to be guilty of the, of the sins that caused the destruction. In other words, it's not that I got to be extra righteous. I have to undo the reasons for that destruction. And therefore, if there's no temple, it's because we're still guilty of the reasons that caused that destruction. You see, because if we wouldn't be guilty of those reasons, we would have the Beis HaMikdash. Another way of putting it is that every second the Beis HaMikdash is not rebuilt, it's as if we are actively destroying it. It's not that it was destroyed and didn't come back, but every second we are re-destroying it. Imagine how you would feel, how we would feel, if we would see the Beis HaMikdash burning before our eyes. But it is. It's burning before our eyes. You know, just to digress a little bit with the, with the story, um, many of you uh, may have heard that the great Chazenish, who lived in Bnei Brak, had a chumrah on, on the laws of Shabbos. Uh, one of his chumras on the laws of Shabbos is he would not use electricity that was generated by the power plants on Shabbos, even if everything was turned on before Shabbos or on a Shabbos clock, because since some of the power is generated by Jewish workers who are violating Shabbos, the Chazenish took the position that we are not allowed to benefit from the Shabbos desecration of Jewish people. And therefore, uh, either you used a lot of candles, oil lamps, or you used private generators, but you don't use the, this is the Chazenish Yishita, you don't use the power grid on Shabbos. Now, I don't want to get into the technicalities. Obviously, the minag of most of you Shalayim is to be lenient, including this uh, yeshiva. But you may notice more and more Avrechim are now getting generators in apartment buildings because B'nai Brak has a whole other political issue. B'nai Brak Chumras are penetrating the Torah community of Yerushalayim. Now, okay, again, it's not really our subject, but the reason I'm bringing it up is that the Chazenish once said that there may be pros and cons to this issue. But how can a Jew be so insensitive that they could benefit from sins that are desecrating of Shabbos? He gave a mushal. Let's imagine you're walking by the Beis HaMikdash and it's burning. And you need a light for your cigarette. So you light your cigarette by the flames of the temple. Now, is that mutter to do? You know, maybe, yeah. <laughs> I mean, the guy would say, tell me where it says it's usher for me to use the flames of the base of Mikdash being burnt. Well, I'll tell you the truth. Maybe I can't find a reason that it's usher. I cannot. But what type of Jewish heart would be so callous and uncaring? So the Chazanish said that when Shabbos is being violated, that's also like the base of Mikdash being oh. destroyed. How can you, I mean, again, I, I don't want to, discourage people from using lights, our minog is where I make but he, but he basically said, how can I use that light? It's like lighting my cigarette by a burning base on Mikdash. That's a very powerful, very powerful muscle. But be this it may, the Talmud Yushalmi is teaching me that I am experiencing the destruction of the base on Mikdash right now. So, why is this important? It's important <laughs> because when Chazal tell us the Beis HaMikdash was destroyed because of A, B, C, D. That doesn't just mean, we'll talk about what those are in a moment, that doesn't just mean those were the problems of the past. No, no, no. Those are the problems we still have even today. Because if we would correct those problems, there would be a Beis HaMikdash. Right? So these Gemaras are extremely important because they are not just giving you historical information. They are actually telling you what you need, I say you, what we all need to correct in our own lives to rebuild the Beis HaMikdash. Yeah. Could we say that these callers, some of these rules, they don't write them just because it's Seichel? Like, it's common sense you would walk by the Beis HaMikdash and leave a cigarette. 
That's why we yeah. didn't write it. It could be. It could be. It's an interesting thing that some things might be so obvious to a person with the Seichel Hayashor, and yet what happens is, as the generations get weaker and weaker, things that were obvious now have to be spelled out. You know, again, without diverging too much from my topic, you know, one would have thought who is a man and who is a woman would be a fairly simple question. <laughs> so we didn't have to explain too much about it. And today, you know, <laughs> there's a whole documentary, who is a woman, right? There. <laughs> the whole issue. So things that are pushed, that were pushed, got to be spelled out. In fact, that's, that's, um, that's a big problem in Jewish education generally that you know, some things were not always emphasized because they didn't have to be emphasized. They were just things that people understood. Today, there's no such thing as people just understand it. Everything has to be you know, spelled out. Even if it's spelled out, they still don't. Yeah, even then, even then, even then. But if you don't spell it out, you know, <laughs> it won't be on the radar, radar at all. So all of us know the famous Gemara in Maseches Yuma that di does differentiate between the first temple and the second temple, right? Uh, and the, the first temple was destroyed by the Babylonians, and that's in the Tanakh. That is biblical. The second temple is post-biblical. And it mentions that the first temple was destroyed for the worst of Eros in the world, Avodazara, idolatry, and sexual immorality, and murder. And that's what the prophets talk about. The prophets talk about all of these Averis. Yermiyahu, Yecheskel, they talk about these Averis. But the second Beis HaMikdash, which was destroyed by the Romans, post-biblical, in the year 68 to 70, where, you know, the, exa the exact year within those three years is an argument. Uh, 70 is the common date of most historians today. Uh, so the Jews were relatively righteous. They kept the commandments. They did mitzvot. So why was there a Chorban Beis HaMikdash and a Golos and death? So the Talmud says, because of Sinat Chinam, they had groundless uh, hatred and polarization. And the Gemara in Yuma says, Bo ure, let us come and see how bad Sinat Chinam is. Because for the Chorban Beis HaMikdash, which occurred because of Avodah Zara, Gili Araya, Shvichostamim, the Babylonian exile was only 70 years. 70 years, meaning 70 years from the Chorban was the second temple. The second temple was built 70 years after the first one. But the Chorban Beis Hamikdash that came because of Sinat Chinam, we're still suffering there. We're still suffering a Chorban of Sinat Chinam. Almost 2,000 years. The Chorban was in the year 70, the secular year, year 70 of the Common Era. We are in the year 2022. Another 48 years, it'll be, uh, it'll be 2,000 years, right? almost 2,000 years at this point. So you see what Sinat Chinam is. Now, if we look around and we ask ourselves, are we still guilty in, of Sinat Chinam and Klal Yisrael? It, it is almost too obvious to even make a point of this so much divisiveness, so much animosity. And let me point out another thing. Sinat chinam is not only when you throw stones at somebody and the like, although we have that too. Sinat chinam can include indifference, coldness, cliquishness. I have my people. I have my group. And I really don't care about people. I mean, sometimes I could draw my line so narrowly that I might be the only one in my group. But okay, but even if a person is not, is not so narrow. But we have our clique. You're outside of my clique. I really don't care about you. That's also sinat chinam. Sinat chinam can be indifference. In fact, Eli Wiesel made a point that the opposite of love is not always hate. The opposite of love might be indifference. Love and hate are, can actually be fairly close. I love somebody deeply. They can do something that really you know, gets me upset. Indifference means you know, your existence makes no difference to me. I really don't care one way or the other. That's the strongest form of real hatred, that that person's existence doesn't even make a difference to me. And this is unfortunately something that all of us have to struggle with, that we need 
to grow in Avas Yisrael, in caring about each other, in seeing the good in each other, in building each other up, giving people chizuk. That's how we can make our heart a place for the Shekhinah. Otherwise, God doesn't come. And there's a beautiful remez to this in this Parsha. So I'm going to get connected to the Parsha. You know, we know that the Megillah that we read on the 9th of Av is Lamentations. And we call it, the biblical name is Eicha. Eicha is how. And it's called Eicha because Jeremiah, Yermio Hanavi, wrote this lamentation. And it begins, Eicha Yashva Vadad. Eicha means how. How is the city sitting so desolate and empty? Ho'ir Rabasi Am, the city that was so full of people. And he's mourning. Now, Baruch Hashem, Yushalayim is not empty today, but it's empty of the Shechina. So that emptiness we have. Now, you're going to notice this Shabbos, if you don't already know this, that the word Eicha, the word Eicha, actually appears in the Parsha as well. And in fact, when the Balkore reads it, the Minog is, he reads that one Pasuk in the tune of Eicha. Right? Eicha has a very sad melody, which is not the same as the Torah reading, but that verse, Eicha, right? And that is when Moshe Rabbeinu is describing how quarrelsome the Jewish people are. And he's saying, I cannot bear all of your problems, all of your fighting, all of your disagreements. I have to get other judges to take some of this work. Eicha, how can I bear it? Says the Medrash. Had the Jewish people listened to Moshe's Eicha, they wouldn't have to experience Jeremiah's Eicha. Oh, wow. Meaning, that's the connection. Meaning to say, Moshe is saying you're so quarrelsome, you fight, you don't get along, you don't make peace, you don't care for each other. Moshe is saying, I can't take it anymore. Now, if we would have listened, if we would have risen to that challenge, we would have been Mesaken, the Sinat China, there wouldn't have been a Chorban. You wouldn't have needed Jeremiah's Zechah. So you have a choice. Listen to Moshe Zecha or listen to Jeremiah Zecha. Choice is ours. If I listen to Moshe Zecha, I don't get Jeremiah Zecha. I don't listen to Moshe Zecha, I get Jeremiah Zecha. Right? That's, the, uh, that's the connection that from that Sinat Chinam came, as it were, the Chorban base Hamikdash. And that is why we actually root the Chorban Beis Hamikdash in the Sinat Chinam. Now, of course, uh, there are questions here we don't have time to get into, because the Chayra, Sinat Chinam is only the Bayes Sheni, not the Bayes Rishon, so how can we root everything in Sinat Chinam? But the truth is, the Meforshim tell us that even the Averis of Avodah Zorah, Gile, Rai, Shvi, were ultimately connected to a breakdown in the unity of Am Yisrael, that Sinat Chinam was in fact connected uh, to that. In fact, it's brought down this association. There are actually 22 days from the 17th of Thomas through Tisha B'Av. 22 days. There's the three weeks, but that's not counting Tisha B'Av. It's 22 days. There were 22 years that Yosef and his brothers were estranged. So it mentions that the 22 years of Mechirat Yosef, which represent the epitome of hatred, are responsible for the 22 days of Chorban that we experience. And all of the associations are there that the Chorban Beis Amikdash is rooted in this Sinat China. So, just want to say as, as we, again, I mean, I, I, even, even as late as today, Mashiach could come the Binyan Beis Hamikdash could come. Now, do I really emotionally believe it? I have to be honest. I, I don't believe it. Well, I, I mean, I don't emotionally believe it. But intellectually, it is absolutely the case that the Geula could come. And we should think about that as a possibility. But if Chas V'Shalom, it does not come. And we will need to fast Saturday night and Sunday May it be Hashem's will that this be the last 
Tisha B'Av of fasting and suffering. And may we merit, may we merit, as the Navi Zacharia promised us, B'Shem Hashem, that this day of Tisha B'Av will be a day of Sason and Simcha, a day of joy and rejoicing in the Binyan Beis HaMikdash, the return of the Shekhinah to the Jewish people and the whole world. So take care. Amen. Amen. Amen.